sands scattered as far as the eye can see, introducing a white rabbit looking lovely and prancing about in the desert. Next, roll in green vegetation everywhere. Sounds like the script for a beautiful advert or whatever can fit into that, doesn't it? But wait, what if I told you that what you just heard was what happened somewhere in Asia? Deserts were waging a winning war of the land yearly, and against everything China tried, the deserts were advancing strongly. China decided to try a secret weapon, not high and mighty irrigation systems or grand revegetation schemes, but rabbits. Yeah, those white fluffy bunnies in the millions. Surprised? Come let me show you how. Deserts are a big problem globally. Our Earth is covered by almost 70% water. While some beautiful plants grow at seabeds, most of what we, humans and livestock, consume grows on solid and arable soil. Green vegetation keeps the soil arable. It helps with making the environment livable and healthy, in addition to being a fertile place for food to grow. Deserts have their wonderful place in our world, but recently they've been slowly encroaching on the precious arable land we have left. Before you stop to look around yourself and conclude, nah, it's not that bad, check this out. Out of the little 30% land we have on Earth, about 41% of it has been declared as arid slash dry by the United Nations. Considering the growing world population of more than 8 billion, that's a staggering statistical figure to come to terms with. Deserts have their place in the sands of time and nature, pun intended, but their boundaries are to be kept in check to ensure that they do not become a problem. Various countries have developed strategies to combat the advancing desert, and China has its share of these conflicts as well. At over around 7,200 square miles, the Kubuchi Desert ranks as the seventh largest desert in China. If you're having issues getting that size in your head, think about Massachusetts. After you're done, think about everywhere being covered with sand from inch to inch. Perhaps every few hundred miles add a scanty-leaved tree with few to no water holes. Not rivers or lakes, but water holes. That way, you get how vast the Kubuchi Desert is. If you look through history, just some decades ago, the Kubuchi Desert was not just a large wasteland of sand. In fact, it was more of a livable desert with scattered villages, livestock, and even rivers. However, the winds were unforgiving and took away many regions that had flourishing vegetation. Rivers became forgotten river beds, and village settlements became empty, vast expanses of sand. With significant desertification, those who had settlements in Kubuchi had to leave. If the winds turned everywhere in the desert into unlivable conditions, perhaps the story would have ended there. But after a few decades, Kubuchi had expanded its territory by over 25 miles, claiming thousands of acres of neighboring farmlands and villages. It was not only about the further desertification of the desert itself, which was the issue, but also its encroachment into already existing savanna and vegetation. Sand dunes covered what used to be farmlands, burying civilizations in vast amounts of sand. There have been recordings of sand dunes covering settlements as much as 200 feet high. It was an ugly sight to behold. Imagine having built a life thousands of acres wide and feeling safe that you were miles away from the desert. A little harsh wind today and some tomorrow and a few years later, you're getting sandstorms blasting through your window. More than sandstorms, your farms are gradually becoming buried until, after leaving your home, you come back to find it forgotten under hundreds of feet of sand. This became the reality for many people living in and around the Kubuchi Desert. By the 1950s, the government knew that it had to do something to deal with the advancing desertification. Full-scale replanting of trees occurred, putting up specific windbreakers and digging of wells strategically across the desert. However, the desert had gained traction in this war and was advancing without showing signs of stopping any time soon. The deserts were not only an unforgiving place with sand and sun, but also a place of little to no moisture for most of it, unbearable cold at night, and burning heat during the day. While the Chinese government kept on looking for solutions to their growing problems, one man decided to make the desert pay rent for the land it had acquired. His name was Wang Wenbiao. Wang Wenbiao was once a poor teacher who lived in Mongolia. He used his bike to get to his classes, often having to traverse through harsh desert conditions, sometimes having his bike half buried in sand. One day he vowed to himself, saying, if I can't escape the desert, I'll make it pay rent. More than just a vow, it was a statement. This statement turned into something so radical that even the United Nations recognized his efforts, efforts that earned him the title Desert King. Having owned a salt company, a vow in his heart, and all of his savings, 
Wang began planting willow trees. Willow trees were not just any kind of trees. They were built for restoring deserts to grasslands. Willow trees had deep tap roots that could reach as far as needed to get water, going as deep as 20 to 30 feet into the ground. This allowed the trees to tap deep into the underground water source and keep the soil around it firm and from shifting. In addition, willow trees grew straight, tall, and when planted appropriately spaced, they became the perfect windbreakers. Now, it's not as though China did not know about these windbreakers before. The issue was getting such trees to thrive in a desert. Mr. Wang was not deterred by previous failures, but went ahead to ambitiously plant about 50 million willow trees. His ambition was to maximize every bit of moisture that the earth could provide. What about getting these trees established in the desert? Mr. Wang looked to a certain tiny fellow who was notorious for destroying roots and vegetations. A fellow that was so notorious farmers hated having them overrun their farms. Rabbits. Mr. Wang didn't look at a fancy irrigation system, but instead at nature's answer to modern problems. The Rex Rabbit. You see, not only was it paradoxical, it was something of repeating a disaster. Hundreds of years ago, the Kubuchi Desert was not just a giant wasteland. No, far from that. The Kubuchi Desert was a large piece of grassland and shrubs with thriving livestock and wildlife in it. So what made the winds take away this mini paradise? Overgrazing. Years and years of farmers feeding their livestock with the vegetation they were not actively replacing is what happened. Back to our story. You can imagine how bizarre it sounded when Mr. Wang decided to introduce rabbits into the Kubuchi Desert. The Rex rabbits, however, were far from fluffy vegetation devourers. These rabbits were built for the job and were specifically designed for the dream Mr. Wang had, and he knew it. You see, from 1988, Mr. Wang had begun planting willow trees aggressively. In a few years, he had gone on to plant about 50 million willow trees. However, he needed fertilizing machines that would work day and night to ensure that the willow trees survived the harsh desert. Rex rabbits were native to Europe. The Rex rabbits that Mr. Wang got were specifically bred for their fur and not meat. They had a pretty high reproductive rate with significant kits in each litter. I'm talking about having up to three to four litters a year, six under intensive breeding programs, with the ability to produce up to 40 kits conveniently in a year. It's astonishing to begin with. Furthermore, these rabbits had beautiful fur that lacked ground hair. This meant that they did not need special treatment to ensure that their fur was well produced after tanning. Special treatment like specialized shaving or hair plucking. Bringing the Rex rabbit was not just a way of introducing a super producing rabbit into harsh conditions. In fact, in addition to producing a large amount of offspring voraciously, these rabbits are rumored to have a hardy nature, surviving extreme climates with a 96% survival rate. Mr. Wang was introducing a fertilization machine that had a high yield of profits. But wait, how were these rabbits going to transform the desert? The Rex rabbits were a beautiful breed for the locals and Mr. Wang. They had beautiful pelts, edible meat, and organs that could serve the ecosystems and the locals. However, they do not digest all the grass seeds they consume. This meant that every grass they consumed had its seeds stored and ready to be planted wherever these Rex rabbits did their business. And their business was extremely good. The Rex rabbits had fecal matter that contained three nutrients, perhaps a fourth, that desert sands needed to sustain life, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. In addition to the nutrients, their pellets contained moisture as well. Introducing the Rex rabbits into the Kubuchi Desert was like taking fertilizer and strategically placing it across the desert every day, everywhere. In addition, every time the fertilizer was placed, grass seeds were planted alongside. It was an ingenious way to continue his mass revegetation dream. Now, remember how Mr. Wang had invested so much into the willow trees? These willow trees were needed to produce shade and greenery for the rabbits. While the willow trees would probably not have lasted till adulthood, the Rex rabbits helped by feeding on their young sprouts. Yes, you heard right. When the Rex rabbits came around to feed and enjoy the mini shade, they did their business. Their business enriched the soil with the nutrients the willow trees needed to grow further. In addition to nutrients, the Rex rabbits were dropping seeds for vegetation that would thrive under the shade of the willow trees as well. Slowly but steadily, the Rex rabbits and the willow tree combination became a closed ecological Disney movie. The willow trees were the key to breaking the desert chain, and the Rex rabbits were the key to ensuring that the willow trees fulfilled their purpose. 
In the meantime, from their synergy, grasses were being propagated throughout the desert. So whenever the rains came back, it was as though magically green grass appeared where it had been lost for almost a century. It was not long before scientists began looking into the willow rabbit eco model. It was estimated that each willow rabbit acre could produce several tons of organic humus in a year. This eco model was so successful that in three to five years, sands that had created times of lack could be turned into farmlands. Mr. Wang's vision was slowly becoming a strong reality. In about a decade of his beginning the willow rabbit model, it was estimated that more than 300 million willows had been planted and were thriving in the Kubuchi Desert. They had reduced wind speed by 90% and had held back about millions of tons of sand per year. Indeed, the desert was beginning to pay rent, just as Mr. Wang had said it would. From the rent that the desert paid, Mr. Wang created a business ecological model that produced life and re-civilization. Mr. Wang went further than just revegetation. He created jobs in the desert and helped reintroduce civilization to places from which people had previously been forced to run away. The Kubuchi Desert was thriving, but the sand dunes needed to be conquered. To do this, Mr. Wang hired over 300 workers and contracted about 100 bulldozers to do the work. By leveling sand dunes, Mr. Wang went on to further expand the windbreaker lines and planted several million more willow trees. More than just revegetation, this initiative empowered families in the area by producing jobs for them. The few thousand rabbits that were introduced into the area today have grown to about a million rabbits, according to some sources, due to their prolific reproduction and farms. Yes, the willow rabbits were now being farmed, primarily to help the revegetation model, but also for their pelts. Slowly but steadily, families were helped to escape poverty by buying into the rabbit farming business. A small investment with Mr. Wang would yield profits of up to three or four times more by the end of the year. More than just providing jobs and greenery, many people who had abandoned the Kubuchi Desert several generations ago began returning to settle there within a decade. Mr. Wang had a vow in his heart to make the desert pay rent, and he made it pay rent dearly. Areas that were not yet conquered by the fast-thriving, self-driven willow rabbit eco-model became transformed into something that Guinness World Records were forced to recognize. A galloping horse that produced power without running. Mr. Wang introduced a mega solar power generation system with nearly 200,000 solar panels arranged to outline a running horse. It was called the Junma Solar Power Plant. The Junma Solar Power Plant was more than just a use of land that was already available. It was an ingenious way to both produce shade in the desert, harvest the power of the sun, provide jobs, and make the desert pay its years of overdue rent. This mega plant produced about one to two billion kilowatts per hour of electricity yearly, enough to produce power for about 400,000 people. For context, this amount of power is enough to give the residents of Miami, Florida electricity to go about their daily activities. More than just producing power, the solar intervention provides shade for grass to grow underneath and acts as a windbreaker against the hard desert winds that sweep tons of sand to unwanted lands. The work done at the Junma Solar Project was also directly involved with the dream to further reduce the effect of global warming. By producing energy, the solar project reduces the carbon footprint compared to the use of fossil fuels to produce electricity. The company also realized billions of dollars during this process. Mr. Wang showed that while desertification and global warming had been fueled by man's industrialization and greed, it was possible to be profitable, help others, and give back to the earth in an innovative manner while still making billions of dollars. A man laden with a dream to make the desert pay rent became the wealthiest landlord while giving back to nature, too. In 2023, the Ministry of Ecology in China performed research that showed wonderful results. They found certain species that were otherwise gone around 1990 to have come back by 2023. In addition, several plant and animal species that were in dwindling populations have been loosely reported to have increased up to four times by 2023 from 1960. If what happened on the surface was astonishing, what happened underground was a marvel. The Kubuchi did not need gold to make people rush into the land, but water. While having shades and green vegetation was beautiful, water was an essential tool in keeping the locals and the animals present. Research showed that the underground water level had risen by about five to six and a half feet in a little over 20 years. 
digging wells to find water was almost half the time easier than it was a generation ago. This could explain why the Kubuchi Desert has now transformed from a place that housed grains of sand for miles unending to a place where even flowers could be seen. Remember how rabbits were described as fluffy disasters waiting to happen on farms and greenhouses? Well, somewhere in Australia, many years ago, a person decided to bring 25 because he wanted to hunt them. If we take a leap by some years, the story became something else. The rabbits had multiplied into a nightmare, literally. Some estimate a population of a billion rabbits, while others say that the population reached a couple of hundred million. We're not just talking about fluffy bunnies prancing about, we're talking about mass loss of vegetation, food crops, underground soil, and even the roots of crops and trees. It was so bad, Australia had to actively eradicate rabbits. So how is it that Australia launched an all-out war against rabbits to conserve their vegetation, while China used them to rebuild its? The answer is control. While Australia had a pest problem, China used a controlled ecosystem loop. The willows provided needed shade and green vegetation for the rabbits, while the rabbits provided manure. Remember the foxes that we mentioned previously? Well, foxes worked to keep the rabbit population under desired control as well. In further exploring how China was able to curb the rabbit issue, when paralleled with the problem that Australia had, the rabbits of the Kubuchi were not free-range rabbits that had no primary owners or carers. In reality, the rabbits in Kubuchi were specifically bred rabbits. Many families ventured into the rabbit business to sell the pelts they produced. So even though the rabbits in Kubuchi were specifically released to targeted locations each time, they were closely monitored and their pelts harvested. The Kubuchi desertification control was more than just a man's dream. It was a statement to the world that desert encroachment could be dealt with wisely and should be taken seriously. It was recognized by global agencies, including the United Nations, as a model for desertification control, a feat achieved by only a few places in the world. In over 20 years, the Kubuchi Desert turned from a vast expanse of sand that was continually expanding to a site dotted with grasses, trees, wildlife, settlements, and a green energy source plant, the Junma Solar Project. The whole story shows how one man's determination could alter the course of history, from planting millions of trees to establishing a mega solar power plant. Everything was used to turn the Kubuchi Desert into a home for its original inhabitants. And yeah, rabbits were the inside men who did the job. Now, some people say that the rabbit story has been blown by the media out of proportion. Some accord the success of the Kubuchi restoration to government funding, the work of many experts and land engineers. There are a few people who are concerned about replicating this model elsewhere, concerns of ecological problems rather than solutions. While all these skeptical views may be true and should be considered, the fact that a desert can be turned into a garden in a few decades by consistent will, ingenuity, and Fluffy Rabbits is a beautiful masterpiece, almost like a story from a fairy tale, but in this world, nonetheless. It's intriguing to see how a man with a dream and a vow, with the help of rabbits, could change a world. Several deserts are cropping up around the world, with multiple solutions being thrown around. Do you think the rabbit approach would ever be tried somewhere else? Or perhaps we'd see another miracle even more astonishing than our rabbit marvel. Let me know in the comments section.